Hello, I'm Gary Mancala. I'm the Director of Liturgy and Music here at uh, St. James Church in Charlestown, West Virginia. And uh, I'm going to lead uh, four sessions uh, on one of my favorite topics, which is the Liturgy of the Hours, uh, or sometimes called the Divine Office. Uh, I was introduced to this many years ago, decades ago, when I was the Director of Music at the North American College which is the American Seminary in Rome. Uh, as a seminary, they obviously prayed the uh, office uh, throughout the day, and I was uh, privileged to accompany that and to set up the uh, liturgical schedules for that, and that's when I became exposed to the, uh, uh, the divine office, the liturgy of the hours in, a, in an intimate way, and I've kept up my, uh, my love uh, ever since then. Uh, we will have uh, four sessions, uh, and they're outlined on the board. First session will be Theology and Structure of the Hours. Second session, the Geography of the Book. The third session is uh, our Roadmap, the Liturgical Year. And then in the fourth session, we will talk about uh, music in the hours. So our first session um, that is uh, happening today is uh, some theology, some, some background and also uh, the basic structure of the hours. I'm going to read at the beginning of this three uh, brief quotes from Blessed Columba Marmion, uh, who has a, uh, a Benedictine abbot uh, in Belgium during the turn of the 20th century. Uh, he is uh, well beloved by uh, uh, various clergy here at the church, and we have a mosaic of him uh, gracing the south transept, uh, south uh, nave uh, in the church. On the liturgy of the church, Blessed Columba writes, nowhere else as in the liturgy can we become so well acquainted with the gestures of Jesus Christ, the words which fell from his lips, the feelings of his divine heart. It is the gospel relived at each stage of the earthly life of Christ, and God, Savior of the world, head of his mystical body, and bringing with him the virtue and grace of all his mysteries for our soul's benefit. That was written uh, in his book, Christ in His Mysteries. The Liturgy of the Hours is actually uh, a full half of the liturgy of the church. The church's liturgy is, is divided uh, into the sacramental liturgy, which most of us are well uh, acquainted with, uh, the Eucharistic Liturgy of Mass, uh, Baptism, Confirmation, uh, Anointing the Sick. That's the sacramental liturgy of the Church. Uh, and that is, for the most part, and in general, um, celebrated by the clergy of the Church, bishops, priests, and deacons. There's also the other half of the liturgy of the Church, which is called the Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, and that is a means of sanctifying the day with prayer. Um, you'll be most familiar with this if you think about a monastery and the monks uh, praying or singing their, uh, their office. Uh, that's the Liturgy of the Hours, and we'll talk in detail about, about that as the sessions go along. The value of the hours comes about uh, because this is actually the official prayer of the church. There are many sacramentals, and devotions that we uh, that we take part in as uh, laity, uh, Stations of the Cross, the Rosary. Um, these are an important part of our own uh, spiritual life and our own uh, development uh, in that respect, but they're not the official prayer of the Church. The Church officially prays with the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, it is Christ in his mystical body, which is us, the church, Christ uh, praying in us as his mystical body, and we praying in Christ, joined with one another uh, in that same mystical body. It's uh, a unity of our prayer with the prayer of heaven, and it's also, uh, according to the documents, uh, a foretaste of uh, the heavenly liturgy that takes place Blessed Columba Marmion wrote again, 
We speak one with him when we take upon us with him all the sorrows, the sighing, the sufferings of Holy Church, and intercede in the name of all, full of confidence in his infinite merits. When we act thus habitually, we go out of ourselves, we forget our own little sorrows and annoyances, and we think much more about God and souls. In return, God thinks of us and fills us with his grace. Give, and it shall be given to you, good measure, and pressed down, and shaken together, and running over. And this comes from Union with God, a uh, Blessed Columbus book on uh, spiritual directing. The liturgy hours is mandatory for all clergy uh, and for religious, uh, so bishops, priests, deacons, those who are in ordained uh, clerical state, as well as consecrated virgins and other religious, uh, they are obliged to pray the liturgy hours. And I heard uh, online just uh, this, this past week, uh, one of the priests who does a lot of uh, videos online mentioned that um, at his ordination, uh, although it is salutary and perhaps expected that a priest will celebrate a daily mass, at his ordination, the promise that he actually made to the bishop who ordained him was to pray the liturgy of the hours. So priests are uh, obliged by that solemn promise that they made to pray that liturgy of the hours daily. Um, the liturgy of the hours, ever since the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, was uh, commended to us as laity um, to join in that prayer and to join ourselves uh, with the clergy and with those around the world uh, to pray that official prayer of the church. It, um, it turns introverts like me into extroverts because even if I'm praying the liturgy hours alone uh, in my bedroom, I am still united with all the entire rest of the world, with all of those uh, Christians who are praying that same prayer at that same time. Um, and in that way, I uh, grow out of myself and become an extrovert in terms of prayer. Um, the uh, general instruction on the Liturgy of the Hours, which is the, uh, the chapters of, uh, of instructions that happen at the beginning of the book, beginning of Volume 1, mentioned this, prayer was the soul of Christ's Messianic ministry. And you'll find in Scripture, very often, Christ uh, resorted to prayer uh, prior to his ministry. Uh, in Luke, at the Transfiguration, Christ and the apostles Peter, James, and John were actually up the, they were on their way up the mountain to pray. And at that point, Christ was transfigured before them. And their comment was, it is good, Lord, to be here. And we can put ourselves in the presence of Christ with those same words whenever we pray uh, the hours. Uh, at the agony in the garden, uh, Christ fell on his knees in prayer and sweat blood in that intense prayer uh, that this passion may, might be delivered from him, if that be God's will, but not his own will, but God's shall be done. And um, on the cross itself, uh, Christ quoted Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, Columbo Marmion uh, likens this to Christ himself praying his divine office as he lay, as he uh, was dying upon the cross. Uh, There's an intimate connection with Christ and with that prayer life. We find in scripture also that the apostles prayed, and they in fact prayed as all Jews did at that time, at specific times during the day, very often matching their time of prayer with the sacrifices in the temple. Uh, we find that Peter prayed at noontime before he had his, his vision of uh, the animals being gathered together. Um, we find Peter and John prayed at the temple at three o'clock. And we find Paul and Silas, prior to their deliverance from prison, prayed at midnight and sang hymns. Uh, so this uh, structured prayer life was part of the uh, Jewish tradition, and certainly the apostles as Jews practiced that 
and from that developed our own Christian uh, view of structured prayer throughout the day. Uh, back to Columba Mormion. Nowhere, as in the liturgy, does there exist such a complete, simple, orderly, and deep exposition of all the marvels which God has performed for our own sanctification and salvation. It is the most perfect expression of revelation, and that most adapted to our soul's needs. It is an exposition which appeals both to the eyes of the body and of the imagination, and which moves the attentive soul to its depths. And that comes also from Christ in his mysteries. So, a basic theology of where the Liturgy of the Hours is coming from. It has its roots deeply in Jewish prayer and uh, has been developed through the two millennia of Christian uh, life that has existed since then. Uh, what we want to do in the remainder of this uh, introductory first session is uh, detail uh, the structure of the hours. There are actually seven hours in the full liturgy, and if you were a monk, a Benedictine monk in particular, you would pray all seven of those hours. Um, let me run through what those are, and then we'll look at them in detail. Remember that the purpose of the liturgy hours is to sanctify the day, to take every moment throughout the day uh, and offer prayer to God uh, at specific times. Um, there are uh, some off, some um, of the hours that are called major hours are more important than the others, which are called minor hours. Um, the office of readings, which uh, previously was called matins, meaning morning, uh, was prayed and still can be prayed as a nighttime hour. It can be prayed before the sun rises, um, or it can be prayed any time throughout the day. Uh, Revisions after the Second Vatican Council took that from being exclusively a nighttime hour to being something that can be prayed throughout the day. Morning prayer, also called lauds, L-A-U-D-S, um, was the, the first prayer in the morning. It um, occurred around 6 o'clock, around the first hour. And it's one of the hinge hours, one of the two most important hours, the other being evening prayer. Throughout the day, uh, the monks and anyone who is uh, partaking in that same prayer life as them would pray daytime prayer. And in a monastery, there are actually three components of daytime prayer, and they would pray all three of them. There's a, a mid-morning prayer, prayed about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, midday prayer, which happens at noon, and uh, mid-afternoon prayer, which would happen around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The instructions for us as uh, working laity uh, is to uh, pick one of those hours, whichever hour you have an opportunity to pray during your work day, um, you would pick the uh, particular prayers and, and the hour that go with that particular time. So if you're praying that mid-morning, you would do mid-morning prayer, noon or mid-afternoon prayer, depending on when you get a chance to break from your work day, turn your hearts to God, and pray uh, daytime prayer. Evening prayer then comes at the close of your work day, usually around 6 o'clock. Together with morning prayer is uh, one of the hinge hours, the two most important that are uh, particularly um, encouraged for us as laity uh, to uh, involve ourselves in. And then uh, at the end of the day, before uh, retiring, before going to bed, uh, is prayed night prayer, uh, often called Compline. Uh, and uh, that is a, a very short prayer, one that might even be uh, memorized. Um, and there are uh, allowances for praying a particular night prayer each day of the week rather than for alternating uh, through the, uh, the seven day uh, pattern that is given in the books. All of the hours, uh, including the minor hours, start with the versicle from Psalm 70, God, come to my assistance with the sign of the cross. Lord, make haste to help me. And that is followed by the doxology. In its newer translation, uh, which came about when this, when this book was published, 
back in the 70s. The newer translation, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Uh, slightly different than the one we know uh, with the rosary, uh, but that's what is given for uh, the doxology in the divine office. That verse, that God come to my assistance, is omitted <clears throat> for whatever the first hour is that you pray during the day. If you follow the old custom of praying matins first, then you actually do what's called the invitatory before matins. That's a, a, a recitation of Psalm 95 with a special antiphon, and the introduction to that is slightly different. Lord, open my lips, a smaller sign of the cross over your lips. And in that case, the general introduction, God come to my assistance, is omitted um, at whatever hour you pray the invitatory. There's a common structure called that I call a building block that happens in every one of the hours, the minor hours and the major hours. And this is the building block. Every hour always has an introduction. It has a hymn at the beginning. It has some sort of psalmody. You'll find that Liturgy of the Hours, the Divine Office, is deeply um, uh, filled with psalms. Um, there is always a reading present. There's a response after the reading. There's always a, a prayer at the end of the hour, and then some sort of closing. Uh, this building block is extended and expanded and parts are uh, inserted for the various other hours. What I'd like to do now is go through um, morning prayer. Um, and you see there's a, a, an outline of morning prayer on the board behind me. We'll take a look at those um, those segments so that you can understand how morning prayer is structured and um, eventually in one of the later sessions we'll actually um, show you where to find all these parts in this book which is called Christian Prayer. This is the one volume edition of the Divine Office, Christian Prayer. The four volume edition that has everything in it, all seven of those hours in their entirety uh, the four-volume version uh, is what priests, uh, deacons, and bishops, as well as religious, use for their, uh, their prayer. Uh, and I'll explain how you can get either of these later. So morning prayer. Uh, morning prayer starts with that introductory verse that I mentioned, O God, come to my assistance and the sign of the cross. If, as I said before, if you are praying morning prayer as the first hour that you pray of the day, then the invitatory would take the place of that introductory verse. Invitatory is Psalm 95 with a special antiphon. After either the invitatory or the simple introductory verse comes a hymn. Um, these hymns uh, in the Latin version of the Divine Office, these hymns are ancient. Uh, they are actually the one place in Catholic liturgy where hymns as such are specified in the rubrics. Uh, there was always a hymn in the divine office, and the hymns that were written by many saints, St. Saint Ambrose wrote hymns, uh, St. Augustine wrote hymns, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas wrote hymns, all those hymns that were written were written for the divine office. Um, the mass as such, the way uh, the mass is written in the Missal, the big red book that the priest uses at the altar, there's actually no hymns that are specified to be sung at Mass. In Catholic liturgy, hymns are designed for the Divine Office, and other things are designed to be sung at Mass, like the Propers, the Introits, the Communions. Sometimes we substitute hymns for those, uh, as has been our tradition in the English-speaking world anyway for close to 50 years. Uh, but those aren't necessarily prescribed for Mass. But here, in the Divine Office, is where you find a hymn specified. The next component of morning prayer is the psalmody. Um, 
there are always three parts to this Albany. In morning prayer, those three parts are aligned like this. There is a morning psalm, a psalm that deals with uh, the start of the day. There is an Old Testament canticle, uh, a um, poetic uh, section from one of the Old Testament books uh, that is uh, prayed as the second part of the psalmody. And then finally, a psalm of praise uh, comes as the third part of the psalmody. Morning prayer is generally structured as a, an office or an hour of, uh, of praise, uh, beginning the day on that kind of note, uh, remembering Christ's resurrection uh, at the beginning of the day. Um, after the, the psalmody, which is the, the, uh, the general day for all three of these parts, we find a reading. The reading of morning prayer is fairly brief, uh, it doesn't begin with any of the normal things that we hear at a, at a reading during Mass. There's no uh, reading from uh, the, the letter of, uh, of Paul to the Corinthians. Uh, there's no introduction to the reading and there's no conclusion at the end. Uh, the reading is just read uh, straight from the Scripture. After the reading, there is uh, there can be if if a, uh, a cleric leads morning prayer, there can be a homily inserted in here, uh, developing the ideas of the reading or developing the particular saint who are celebrating on, on that day. Uh, after the reading or after the homily, if there is one, comes a short responsory, which is a dialogue that happens between the leader and uh, the congregation. Um, and after that responsory comes the highlight, the most important part of um, morning prayer or evening prayer, which is the gospel canticle. Um, you'll notice that there's a progression in the same kind of progression you, you see at Mass. If you think about the three readings that we hear at Mass, there's an Old Testament reading and a psalm, which comes from the Old Testament as well, followed by a New Testament reading from either one of the epistles or from Revelation um, or from the Acts of the Apostles and followed by the Gospel which comes last. You see the same order here in morning prayer. You've got a psalm, an Old Testament reading. This reading during morning prayer also always comes from the Old Testament. And then finally we have the Gospel reading uh, which is the climax. And in morning prayer the Gospel canticle is uh, Benedictus, or the canticle of Zechariah that comes from uh, Luke. That is the canticle of Zechariah when he uh, is finally, uh, his, his mouth is loosed and he can, he can praise uh, the, uh, the coming of the Messiah. After this gospel canticle, which can be highlighted, we all stand up for that, by the way, too, just as the gospel of Mass is, is highlighted by a special posture by standing. We do the same thing in the Lord morning prayer. Uh, we stand for this gospel. Um, after, and, and that can be also uh, accompanied by uh, incense. The, uh, the cleric who is leading can incense the altar and the congregation during the saying of that benedictus. Um, after the benedictus comes some um, intercessions or prayers to begin the day. Uh, these are concluded with the Lord's Prayer. After that, there is a concluding prayer for the uh, for that particular hour. If it's a saint's day, or if it's uh, a particular feast of the Lord that we're celebrating, or of the uh, Blessed Virgin, uh, that prayer will be the same. It will be identical to the prayer that is prayed at Mass that same day. It's the collect which you hear at the beginning of Mass on a saint's day, or a particular uh, feast of the Lord, is the same prayer that's used to conclude the morning prayer. After that, there's a blessing um, by a cleric, the same blessing you would hear at Mass, the Lord be with you with your spirit. Um, may Almighty God bless you, may the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If uh, morning prayer is not led by a cleric, you know, a, a lay person who's leading, there, or if a cleric is praying morning prayer on his own, 
there's a special uh, blessing. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. That blessing is used um, by a laity and by anyone if they're praying in private. Um, and then if uh, it is a public celebration and a cleric is leading it, then he will dismiss us. Go in peace. Uh, thanks be to God. Um, so that's the structure for morning prayer. The structure for evening prayer is almost identical with one change, two changes, I guess, two changes. Um, it begins with an introductory verse. Obviously, evening prayer, hopefully, is not the first prayer that you are praying in the day, so you would never do the infinitory before evening prayer. So you'll start with the introductory verse, O God, come to my assistance, O Lord, make haste to help me, uh, which is followed by the doxology, and then a hymn. Know, the psalmody still retains three elements like it does in morning prayer, but those three elements change slightly. Uh, there are two psalms at the beginning of the psalmody for evening prayer, and this is convenient because some of the psalms are rather lengthy, so to include a, psalm, a lengthy psalm here uh, might be more than the hour itself can handle. So very often a lengthy psalm will, will be divided and the first half will be the first part of the psalmody, the second half will be, will be prayed as the second part of the psalmody. The last part of evening prayer psalmody is a New Testament canticle, similar to the Old Testament canticles, but now coming from one of the uh, epistles. Uh, some of the more poetic parts of Paul uh, are prayed as a canticle uh, at the end of the psalmody for evening prayer. The reading that comes after this New Testament canticle now comes from the New Testament to preserve the order of Old Testament, New Testament, Gospel. So we had two Old Testament psalms. We had the New Testament canticle here. So to uh, follow that with an Old Testament reading would be breaking that order. So this reading is always from the New Testament, uh, very often from Revelation. Uh, it can be followed by a homily if a cleric is leading or uh, evening prayer. After that, we have the responsory, which is that dialogue, that short dialogue that happens. And then we have the highlight of uh, evening prayer, which is the gospel canticle, the singing of the gospel canticle. For evening prayer, that particular canticle also comes from Luke, um, but it is the Magnificat, uh, the canticle of Mary. This is the prayer that Mary prayed uh, when she visited Elizabeth, uh, both of the uh, relatives were pregnant. Um, and as in morning prayer, during the Gospel Canticle, the leader, the, the clergy who is leading, can incense the altar and the people. And of course, we always stand up for that Gospel Canticle uh, as it's sung. This is followed exactly the same way. The intercessions happen after the Canticle. The last intercession at evening prayer, um, which has a tone of thanksgiving for the day that has just transpired, the last of those intercessions is always a prayer for the dead at evening prayer. These intercessions conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Uh, there's a closing prayer, which would be the same as for uh, morning prayer, the same prayer if you're celebrating the same office during the day. and that. Uh, seems a little strange, but I'll explain why you might not be in a minute. Uh, the concluding verse uh, is followed by the blessing and dismissal uh, and using the same structure as you would at morning prayer. Uh, you might not be praying the same hour in the morning and in the evening. Um, for example, um, if you were praying your office the day before the Annunciation, the Solemnity of the Annunciation. In the morning of that day, March 24th in the morning, you would pray um, likely uh, a morning prayer that comes from the, the Lenten weekday that you happen to be on. In the evening though, since this whole structure came out of Jewish tradition, uh, the Jewish tradition is that the day begins with sundown. Uh, which is why the Jews um, can, they, they attend synagogue uh, on Friday evening because that is already their Sabbath, their Saturday. Um, 
we took that same idea and we have, um, for all solemnities like the Annunciation, we have uh, a evening prayer that is prayed the night before the day itself. So on that night, March 24th in the evening, you actually will be praying what's called First Vespers or Evening Prayer 1 for the feast, the solemnity that happens the next day. So on that day, you'll be praying two different versions of morning prayer and evening prayer, and obviously they're going to have different prayers, different concluding prayers associated with them. Uh, on the day itself, on the solemnity of the Annunciation, you obviously pray morning prayer in the morning and use that same prayer, concluding prayer, and you would pray second Vespers or evening prayer two in the on the evening of that feast day itself. Um, we'll get into a little more of that as we talk about the uh, liturgical year and how that uh, developed. Um, the other offices, well, the other major office is Office of Readings, and it has a, a similar structure to this. Uh, it starts with a different verse. There's a hymn at the beginning. The psalmody is actually three different psalms, or three parts of a psalm in the Office of Readings. This reading, there's actually one more part that comes in there. Uh, let's do this. To take us from the psalmody into the readings, there's a, a short verse that's inserted. The reading and responsory at the Office of Readings, since those are specifically designed to uh, offer us larger uh, chunks of scripture, there are actually two readings. There's a, uh, a reading that comes from scripture itself with the responsory. There's also a reading that comes from other sources, uh, the Church Fathers, uh, uh, other documents, um, some of the, the, the sermons, the homilies that were given um, by the saints um, are often used during the office of readings. Um, and occasionally uh, a biographical um, reading uh, about the saint or some of his writings will be that second reading. So the first reading would be from scripture, the second reading would be uh, from another source. There is no gospel canticle or intercessions or the Lord's Prayer in the office of readings. After the reading and the responsory, the only thing that is prayed in the office of readings, and this is only on Sundays, feasts, and Sundays, would be another canticle called the Tadeo, uh, which is a hymn of praise. That is omitted all through Lent, just like we omit the word Alleluia during Lent and the Gloria. The Tadeo is omitted from the office of readings during Lent. Uh, there's a concluding prayer, and there's a, uh, a different uh, blessing dismissal that occurs at the end of the office of readings. Um, the, those are the three major hours, um, morning prayer, evening prayer, office of readings. The minor hours, which are daytime prayer, whichever of the three you choose to pray, and night prayer, uh, have a similar structure, but they're much simpler. Uh, they're designed to be prayed uh, fairly quickly. Uh, if you're in the middle of your work day, you can't take uh, time out, perhaps, to go through a whole office of readings. Um, so the church has given us uh, a brief uh, time to turn to God. Um, it uh, consists of introductory verse, a hymn, uh, three psalms. There is no verse, there is no there's a short name, uh, there's a canticle, and then there's a concluding prayer. Uh, so it's quite a bit abbreviated. And night prayer is similar uh, to this. There actually is uh, a canticle that happens in night prayer. It's called the Nuptimitis, or uh, uh, the Canticle of Simeon. Uh, and that is prayed at the end of the day. There's an examination of conscience. That takes place up here actually prior to the hymn. Uh, examination of conscience and an act of penitence. Um, uh, this is definitely a conclusion uh, of our day, a way of meditating on what has gone on, a, uh, a liturgical examination of conscience that happens uh, each day as we pray night prayer. Uh, night prayer 
There are seven versions of night prayer in the, uh, in the liturgy hours. There's one for each day of the week. So night prayer really does not uh, tie into the church seasons. So if you're uh, praying night prayer on Monday in Advent, and a Monday in Lent, and a Monday in Easter, it's going to be the same night prayer. So it's tied to the day of the week, uh, not any of the seasons. Uh, so there are seven versions of it. And you certainly can pray the proper one for each evening, but the church has given us the opportunity, since uh, this very often is prayed quite near the bed, um, to memorize one and just pray that from memory uh, each night. And that would be the one that is given for Sunday, uh, for Sunday evening. That can be memorized and used on any of those days of the week. The last thing we'll talk about in this first session are liturgical gestures. Uh, I mentioned uh, at the beginning of each hour, a sign of the cross is made. Um, and in general, with the introductory verse, it's a large sign of the cross, as you normally would make. Uh, God, come to my assistance. The Lord, make haste to help me. There are two other signs of the cross that are given, that are made during um, morning prayer. One is during the gospel canticle. So we stand up for the Gospel Canticle, and at the beginning, we make the sign of the cross. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, or my soul claims the greatness of the Lord, the benedictus and the money of God. So that's the second sign of the cross during morning prayer. And the third one is made during the blessing, either the blessing given by the priest or deacon or bishop, or the one that we do on our own. Uh, may the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, etc. So three signs of the cross made uh, over our body during morning prayer and evening prayer. A small sign of the cross is made over our lips when we do the introduction for the invitatory. Uh, o Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will proclaim your praise. Uh, the other two signs are made as uh, would otherwise be made. Um, there are bows that generally happen during um, the office, uh, just like there are vows during Mass. Uh, there's a vow in the Creed during Mass, there's a vow any time the Trinity is mentioned. Uh, in a similar way, when the names of the persons of the Trinity are mentioned in the Liturgy Hours, Glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's a vow that is made. Um, the different postures that happen during hours, during the divine office. Some of them are specified in the rubrics. Some of them are up to the individual community. Uh, the monastery or the, the parish that is praying uh, may have traditions or that are different than other monasteries or parishes, and that's okay. Uh, the mandatory ones, the ones in the rubrics, are that we stand at the very beginning of the hour during the invitatory or the introductory verse. We stand for the hymn and uh, we stand for the doxology uh, that comes after that verse. We generally sit for the psalmody, for the three components of the psalmody. Um, many parishes and monasteries will stand for the doxology at the end of each of those psalms and bow as they are standing um, and then be seated for the next psalm. That's up to the community itself. It's not mandated in the rubrics. Um, you also sit for the reading, whether it's a short reading or a long reading, and you sit for the homily if it's given, and for the responsory that comes after the reading or after the homily. And uh, then, as I mentioned earlier, you would stand for the gospel canticle out of respect for uh, the gospel reading that we are singing. And from there until the end of the hour, you would remain standing until the blessing and dismissal. Um, just a few comments on resources. Um, I will put together, um, I have this booklet um, in, uh, right now it's in uh, a publisher form. I'll get it in a PDF form. And we will try to post this on uh, the various uh, social media platforms. Facebook or on YouTube, where you are finding this resource right now. And uh, you'll have the online um, 
URLs for various resources that are listed here. Let me just mention the two books that I talked about earlier. Probably more useful to laity who are um, beginning the journey into the Liturgy Hours is this book called Christian Prayer. This one is published by um, uh, Catholic Book Publishing. It's available uh, in many gift shops, including our own St. Zita's cover. Uh, it's about $40 for the book. Uh, you can also get it online easily, get it on uh, Amazon and uh, other sources. Uh, that's what most laity use to pray the hours. Uh, when I was in Rome, since the seminarians are using the four volume version, I had to get this. Um, and this is much more expensive. It goes for about $150 for all four volumes. They uh, come in a set that has a different color for each of the books. This is the Advent Christmas book. Uh, it's the first volume. Um, you can also get this in, in, in all black. Um, but I actually would not recommend you running out and buying this four volume book, uh, four volume edition. There's a revision to this. This um, came out in the 70s, uh, so right after the council, and it hasn't really been touched since then. Uh, there's supplements that are uh, that come about um, that give you prayers for various new saints, um, but the book itself hasn't been touched for 50 years uh, or so. They are revising this, so the second edition of the Liturgy Hours will be uh, coming out. The, the bishops in the United States uh, are working on this English translation, this English version of it, and uh, it's in that process now where they review parts of the book and send it over to Rome for uh, uh, approval of the translation. It's a long process. Uh, obviously, four volumes that are a couple thousand pages each is a lot of material to review. Um, they have approved the Psalms, which are the biggest chunk of this, uh, of this set of volumes. Uh, they're actually Psalms that were translated by the um, uh, Abbey in Conception, Missouri, Conception Abbey, uh, did a, a new translation of the Psalms. And they are actually available now for us. Um, that will, at one time, become the Psalm translations that are used throughout the English-speaking world for liturgy, including any Psalms that happen at Mass, like the Responsorial Psalm. Those will all be new translations uh, once this comes to be. I am guessing that this uh, four volume version of the Liturgy of the Hours probably won't happen in, in its revised form for another five or ten years. But I wouldn't recommend going out and buying this one and using it only for five years and then having it a whole new set if you're interested in that once the translation, the, the revised translation, translation comes about. Uh, obviously, when that happens, this one volume version will be revised and will be published. Could get either of those uh, when that happens. Um, so thank you for listening, and uh, this uh, concludes session one.